Welcome to the Psych Central Show, where each episode presents an in-depth look at issues from the field of psychology and mental health, with host Gabe Howard and co-host Vincent M. Wales. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of the Psych Central Show podcast. My name is Gabe Howard, and with me, as always, is Vincent M. Wales. And we are very excited to have a guest with us today who literally wrote the book on moving forward past trauma. Specifically, he says, thriving in the aftermath of trauma. Ken, welcome to the show. How are you? Thanks, Gabe and Vince. I'm doing well. How are you guys today? We're great. We're doing fantastic. Ken, introduce yourself a little bit. Okay. Well, I spent uh, 21 years in the Navy after a failed attempt to play um, professional ice hockey right out of high school. And um, the majority of my career is a bomb disposal um, specialist. And then I got out of the Navy and started a small company that ended up doing fairly well. And, and we were able to sell the company. And really now today I'm spending most of my time uh, as a grandfather of four beautiful young grandkids and a philanthropist and really trying to change the way that we treat uh, PTSD, specifically right now in combat veterans. Although the book that we'll talk a little bit about today um, is really focused on the civilian community. We keep getting asked a lot um, the outcomes of our, our combat stress recovery programs have been really good and we keep getting asked a lot are the tactics and techniques that we use for veterans you know will they work with civilians and we we say yes and we know that for a couple of reasons one is we put civilians through the program uh, including a former nfl football player and two is we've seen those outcomes and measured some of those outcomes so we feel pretty confident but to re- reach a larger audience we thought if we could write a book that, that would be a great way to reach a, a larger Fantastic. audience you know, that That's sounds great. Yeah, that I is really cool. Thank you. Ken, I have to ask you something that doesn't really have anything to do with mental health first. Bomb <laughs> disposal specialist. I mean, wow. Yeah. That, that <laughs> just sounds like one of those careers that, I mean, wow. Tell us about disposing of bombs. I am so curious. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's a great career. It, it, it sounds crazy. People say, how the heck can you disarm a bomb? But one of the great things the military does is train us over and over and over again until you get to a point where the training kicks in on the battlefield and, and you get good at what you do. And uh, it's, it's just the way the military is. We're, we're the, I think we're the epitome of post-traumatic growth, you know, the military force. It's interesting. I keep, I keep getting asked a lot, what the heck the bomb disposal guy doing in the mental health world? But, you know, what I tell people is that, you know, we keep watching all the negativity surrounding veterans, you know, including the suicide rate of 20 a day and, I just keep telling people that, you know, in the profession I grew up in, you just can't make mistakes. And when you do, uh, they're normally lethal. And it um, just seems like we just keep making the same mistakes over and over doing these traditional treatments. And what I'm hoping to do is bring some of my bomb disposal expertise, and at least the approach that we take and, and the training approach to teach people how to disarm bombs, take that to, to this whole concept of training people on how to live a meaning and productive life in the aftermath of trauma. Ken, how do we want to define trauma exactly? At the end of the day, trauma is this whole thing that sets you back from your belief system. And that's where we end up getting disconnected in, in, our, in our system. That if something happens that's really dealing with, with your belief system, and, and then it settles in with you in a, in a way that the body just, just can't believe and has a, an adverse reaction to. And that's really kind of where, where trauma kind of settles in, in, in the body. And that's why this program that we run is really focused on this whole concept of, of, of getting that system out and talking about what happened to you. But it's really this whole fight with your belief system is what is, is traumatic because everything is different for everybody else. Obviously, if more, you're a mortician and you're in the business of dead people, seeing dead people probably doesn't bother you that much. You, you get trained to, to see that over and over again and, and Although, you know, there may be one or two days that are difficult, for the most part, it's your job and you're trying to get through it. But the other person who's never seen a dead body, when they see the first one, it creates massive traumatic response. And that, that's really what, what this is about, is because what happens to us as humans is, is all this training that we go through in life, whether it's at your childhood or as you age, it really prevents you and holds you back from having a belief system that is kind of congruent is what we would say you know the ability to kind of to, to live a life where your your thoughts feelings and actions are are in fact aligned and you can respond to a situation of a traumatic kind of experience thank you 
I think that's perfect. Thank you so much. Hmm. You know, that's a very interesting question, Ken. Do you yourself suffer from PTSD? Is this something that you have personal experience with, or is it just what you've seen in your coworkers and the people that you've worked with? I personally don't have PTSD. Um, you know, I've been through some traumatic things. I, I, you know, I grew up here in the D.C. area, so my dad got out of the Army. He became a cop in D.C., and our, my mom died. My dad's wife, first wife died at, you know, when I was seven years old. She was 29. She had a horrific battle for cancer for the last two years of her life. So I talk a little bit about in the book. I had a, a alcoholic grandfather who was a, a combat veteran from World War II in Korea and watched some of the abuse in that household as a kid. And, you know, then in 1989, I got busted up really bad in a parachute jump. So I've had some traumatic events occur, including some friends die on the battlefield and but that's what, you know, that's what this book's all about is that, you know, these are things that, that shouldn't hold us back in life. They're, they're, they're what life's about. And, you know, what we're trying to do is teach people how you get through them. So no, I don't suffer with PTSD, but, you know, I've had my share of traumatic events in my life. Yeah, it certainly sounds like it. So regarding the book, how long had you been working on aftermath of trauma stuff before you got the idea of doing the book? And what triggered doing the book? Yeah, well, that, that's a good question for me because I, I keep having to go back and create this timeline. So we, this September uh, of 2018, will we'll be open for five years. So we've been probably running this program, Warrior Path, right around four years now. And approximately 16 or 18 months ago, we got a big grant to basically create a curriculum. One of our donors asked us if we could scale this. And the first place we scaled it to is our new location in Arizona. And we're working with teams now in Texas and Florida to, to bring it out to more people. But we got funding to basically scale, create a curriculum to scale it. And then also to have two doctors, two clinical psychologists, study the, the outcomes of our program over an 18-month longitudinal study. And I think we're 16 months into that now. We just published our 12-month data which is about two to three times as effective as traditional, you know, prolonged exposure, cognitive processing therapy um, modalities. And, and the book inspiration really came from this question that we get asked so many times, is, you know, I, we're seeing all the success you have with combat veterans, but will it work for civilians? And that was really the inspiration, um, mm -hmm. um, you know, for the, for the right end of the book. Thank you so much. One of the things that you've mentioned a, a couple of times during the course of the show is something called post-traumatic growth. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, I think, you know, so I went on this journey and I went around the country and talked to top psychiatrists and psychologists about PTSD, people who had really published some interesting stuff specific to combat veterans and specific to veterans who had come home from, from different wars and battles. And I ended up meeting this psychologist down at the University of North Carolina. His name's Rich Tedeschi. And about 35 years ago, Rich and a colleague of his, Lawrence Calhoun, set out to study wisdom and how, how the human really creates, you know, this lifelong learning to create wisdom in their core competencies of life. And during this, the first group of people they studied were families who had lost children to cancer, bereaved families, primarily because they had seen some outcomes of these families and some of the really interesting things they had done on, after the death of their child. And like I always tell everybody, and Tedeschi would tell you the same, is that every one of those families, you know, would probably, including give up their life, do anything to get their child back. But, but this experience, this traumatic experience, it really led them to do some really remarkable things and to gain this level of wisdom that was something that they didn't have before this traumatic event. So, you know, the, the short concept of post-traumatic growth is what doesn't kill us makes us stronger. The longer version of it is, is, that, is that really we look inside and we take this opportunity when we take this knee from the struggle, which takes us down, as maybe in certain respects as low as you can get in life. And then how do you how do you come back from that? What's the aftermath look like? So if you look at traditional mental health treatment, we're all about really focusing on, on symptom reduction, right? You're depressed, so I want to make you a little less depressed. But the truth is... That just allows us to, what we would call, survive in life. And really what we hope is that people can take these opportunities and really turn it around and thrive in life. And that's what, that's what we're really talking about when we talk about post-traumatic growth. Well, I like what you say there about only treating the symptoms. That is quite frequently what happens. We know that it's important to get to the root of what the problem is. And it certainly sounds like you are 
able to do that in, in this method that you have. It is. And, and one of the phases of post-traumatic growth is this whole concept of disclosure. And what we try to do is spend a session in our, in our intense retreat model, spend a session where folks are really getting empty in their rucksack, right? We, we, we go through life with a variety of things from the day we're born, you know, the adverse childhood experience issues, and then you join the military, you go to war, and, you know, somebody's killed in the battlefield next to you, or your best friend loses his legs, or, you know, you get severely injured, whatever those issues are. And, and really, once you start talking about that, the disclosure aspect of, of healing is really where that, that turning point in post-traumatic growth starts. And that's the, that's the really interesting part of, of the program, because really what we do is we have guides. We don't call our therapists therapists. We call them guides, We're basically instructors, because what we do is a training program. And after we do this, this whole concept of disclosure, we really then try to create a new positive forward looking story so people can live this life that they're living uh, the way they want to be remembered. And that, that's kind of that second phase of post-traumatic growth, which is creating this new story in your life. One of the questions that I want to ask is, what do you say to people that really sort of look at this as, oh, you're saying there's a silver lining to something bad that's happened to me. You know, in the mental health community, we have some people that look at like serious mental illness as a gift. It gives you genius or creativity. And sometimes people look at stuff like this and you're saying, oh, well, you think you're better because something bad happened to me. What do you say to those people that might feel that you, that's what you're saying? Well, I don't, I don't feel that way at all. I mean, nobody wants anything to happen bad to them. But I think what you can do is you can look through the history books at some really interesting stories. Let's, let's talk specifically in the combat sense about prisoners of war in Vietnam or Holocaust survivors in World War II. And you can see that these folks who came home from arguably the worst that humanity has to offer. Right, not the car wreck, not the sight of a dead body, and not that any trauma is worse because really it's the reaction to the trauma that's that's what worse. There's a disability to handle adversity. Some people might call it, you know, resiliency. You know, that if you're more re resilient than the person next to you, you know, maybe your level of handling trauma is higher. But at the end of the day, we don't want anybody to suffer. But what we believe solely and strongly is that no matter who we are in life. If you're a human and you're on this earth, you're going to live a life of ups and downs. Things are going to happen. Not great things happen in our lives. Even even the loss of a parent. I'm a pretty pretty tough guy, and I tell everybody I lost my mom at seven years old. I lost my dad, you know, five years ago. My dad passed away, and it it took me three months to get out of the funk. And you know what I tell everybody is there's, there's what you have to figure out in life is, is this whole concept and whole ability to self-regulate. Because if you can't self-regulate, then what ends up happening is you self-medicate, and that leads us into these areas where there is never a silver line, and you know you feel like you know what what's going to happen. And I think that's what happens with struggle is that you really, really get drawn to your knees, and it, it gives you this opportunity to look inside and and start to ask some you know really hard questions. You know why why is this happening to me? Not why me, not playing the victim, but why is this happening to me? What can I do? to be a better person? How can I create the life that I want to live? And really look at that. And, and when struggle doesn't occur in your life, which, you know, there's not many people that can say that, but if, if a deep struggle doesn't occur in your life, then it never gives you that opportunity to take a, take a pause and, and, and look at this. And that's really what the silver lining is, if you want to call it that. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp.com. Secure, convenient, and affordable online counseling. All counselors are licensed, accredited professionals. Anything you share is confidential. Schedule secure video or phone sessions, plus chat and text with your therapist whenever you feel it's needed. A month of online therapy often costs less than a single traditional face-to-face -face session. Go to BetterHelp.com forward slash Psych Central and experience seven days of free therapy to see if online counseling is right for you. BetterHelp.com forward slash Psych Central. A lot of people out there who don't really grasp the depths of trauma and how long it can affect a person might come out with the old homily, time heals all wounds. What do you think about that? Well, I, I, I do think there's some truth in the grieving process that time is your friend. But I think that time is really your enemy in the traumatic environment. And one, one example I can give you is we had a young guy come through our program 
And there's one day in our program where we really focus on childhood trauma and, and the gifts that are given from your family. But the, 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 what we would call in the mental health world, adverse childhood experiences, what happened in your life? And, and there's 11 of them, sexual abuse, physical abuse, verbal abuse, poverty, neglect, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, these types of things. And this young man, who was a pretty tough dude, had been to combat, he'd done five tours in Afghanistan, two tours in Iraq. And when it came down to it, when he unpacked all this stuff in his disclosure session, for three years of his life, he was sexually molested by an uncle. And at 16 years old, he finally ran away from home, lived in a car for two years, in and out, working, working small you know, fast food jobs until he could sign for himself to join the military. And what we found was after all these deployments and another 16 or 17 years away from this lifestyle and, and, and in the military and seeing more trauma in Iraq and Afghanistan, the thing that was really holding him back was this, was this sexual abuse in his family. And what happens is if you don't get this off your chest is what the science of post-traumatic growth shows is that if you can't disclose this, if this is something you carry a, around with you, the shame and guilt of it will just hold you back and back. So I don't believe personally that time heals trauma. I do believe that time helps a lot with grieving, but the time really can be an enemy in, in, in trauma. The childhood issues that you are mentioning are, are things that Gabe and I are kind of familiar with. We both have abandonment issues from, from our very early days. Yeah, and time has not made it better. And I always kind of think when people throw up the whole time heals all wounds, what they're saying is, is we don't know how to help you and therefore we're not going to try, <laughs> just wait it out. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'm not laughing at you by any means. It's a, I say, I've heard that so many times, uh, Gabe and Vince, it, it, it drives me crazy. It's, it's almost like this mental health expert is at this point where they just can't figure out how to help you. And it's like, well, listen, you know, leave my office, your insurance payments are up and, and time will help you, you know, as the next few months get by, you'll get better. And it's just not true. Not only it's not true, but it's kind of dangerous because it makes it sound like if you it do is. nothing and wait, you'll get better. When in actuality, if you do nothing and wait, people tend to get worse. Um, being yeah. proactive is, is really something that leads to stronger mental health outcomes than being reactive. You know, reactive Absolutely. is often a crisis. Let's talk about how the general public will use your book. So if I were somebody who had issues with trauma and I picked up your book, what would I expect to find? How would it help me? What are some you know, quick and dirty things that I would learn? You know, the short answer, I think, on the book is that we have tried to put a prescriptive solution together in the book. You know, you see a lot of books on trauma and post-traumatic growth where they talk about you know, Sally, who was in a car accident, she was paralyzed and she went on to win a gold medal in the, you know, Paralympics or something like that. But this isn't about other people's stories. Although some of Josh and my personal stories are woven through the book, this is really a prescription. So what I try to tell everybody is imagine you're on a road and, and on the edge of the road, you've got two lines, right? On the right side, you've got this white line and on the, and the center line is, is yellow. And, you know, that car, it weaves in between the yellow lines. Hopefully you don't get outside of it. But what those two lines and our feeling represent in your life, on one side is what we call regulation practices. And I've said it once already, which was, if you can't self-regulate, what happens up happening normally is you self-medicate, and that leads to bigger, bigger problems than, you know, than, than the trauma in itself, you know, because you just, you just go down the wrong kind of rabbit hole there. So what we say is, learn how to self-regulate. How do you breathe when the stress and anxiety comes upon you? meditation, exercise, yoga, overspending. You look at a lot of people who are suffering with trauma, that, you know, this whole concept of retail therapy, you know, shopping, and then they realize they buy something nice and they can't afford it. Now they're financially in debt and the finance, financial problems in a family, you know, weigh on them so much. And it's, you know, you look at divorces in the United States and tons and tons of data that shows that, that one of the biggest things that couples argue about is financial, you know, with the finances in, in their family. So we focus on four areas of wellness, mind, body, spirit, and financial. And when I say spiritual um, issues specifically, we're not a religious-based kind of program or a religious book. But when we talk about spirituality, we talk about this whole concept of your character, your, your ethical behavior and your character as an individual, your service to others, and your relationship to others. And that, to us, is really what tightens up this, the spiritual aspects of it. So one line on the road is, is this ability to self-regulate, or your, what we call your regulation practices. On the other side of the road is your network. 
And what we know is that humans thrive on relationships and that the best relationships are, are mutual, right? But they're not one way. And that we end up as humans kind of becoming the average of the three to five people we spend the most time with. So if you can get a network, get the toxic people out of your life and get a network around you that's healthy, then at least you have somebody healthy to talk to when things are going bad. And that doesn't mean you can't have some friends that are a little toxic. I always tell people, you know, Wednesday night, we like to go bowling and, you know, drink beer and eat some chicken wings. And the guys that we drink beer and eat chicken wings aren't the guys that I would want to talk to if I was having, you know, some real problems, but, but they're fun. And, and, and a day of fun's not bad, but if that's your whole life every day and you don't have that network of solid people in there, then, you know, then you end up having to rely on a therapist or, you know, the chaplain or whoever else it might be because you just haven't built this strong network around you. So, you know, I think the short answer is that those are the two main things is creating a positive network and creating this ability to self-regulate. And that's, that's really where the book leads you through this journey. Excellent. Thanks for describing that. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Thank you. What I want people to really understand, I guess the question is, is, is this something that anybody can do? I, I mean, I think that's what I want to walk away when they read Struggle Well. I, mean, I think Josh, my co-author, Josh Goldberg, he has a funny part in the book during one of his stories. And Josh tells everybody that grew up as a, an indoor Jew. And what he means by that is he was you know, never exposed to anything, you know, outside of the house. You know, he had a father who was a doctor, a mother who was a teacher, and his whole life was about how does he get, you know, get into a good college, how does he become a professional, how does he succeed in, in life, and then boom, trauma hits him, and he's never had anything happen to him as a kid, and, you know, next thing he knows he's in a divorce, he's losing his job, and, and, and one of the therapists that he went to see to said, you know, he had suffered from, you know, thousands of emotional paper cuts, and, and rather than, you know, the, the experience maybe where I had, where I was, you know, busted up in a parachute accident and didn't think I'd be able to walk or serve my country anymore. And it's like, Josh can't put his finger on that one thing, but the things that led up to it were, were significant. And that's really what, what I want people to understand is that we're all different and all of us handle trauma differently based on the training that we've had since we were born. And what we hope is that you understand that we feel very strongly that this book can train you and how to deal with struggle and that how to embrace it, how not to look at it, you know, and stare at it, but how to, how to continue on with your life. And I think the last thing I'll tell you guys, which is, which is really always my analogy, uh, uh, you know, with PTSD and, and, and this negative response to traumatic events is that life is, you know, kind of like driving a car, which is, you know, you've got this beautiful car and, and you, let's say for me, it's a, your dream car and it's this beautiful red Ferrari and, I'm driving this red Ferrari down the highway going 10 miles an hour and just staring in my rearview mirror. And things that we talk about that are traumatic in our past, there's nothing we can do about them. They're there. And the more you stare at them, the worse worse it is for you. And this, as you guys mentioned earlier about your, your abandonment issues, it's like there's nothing I can do for you. There's, there's probably nothing you can do, and there's damn sure nothing anybody else can do, including medicated away. It's always going to be there. But if you can learn how to live in the present, sit in this beautiful Ferrari seat, and understand the gauges in it, and understand how to shift the gears, and know that that car goes 200 miles an hour, and like any good driving school would teach you, you've got to be able to look in your mirrors because you want to know what's behind you or on the side of you. But what you can't do is stare at them because this car's got this big windshield. It's five feet wide and three feet tall. And all you got to do is, is really set a vision and a goal where you want to go, and it'll get you there. And that's really what we want to focus on is, is how do we get out of living in the past? And that's what holds most people back when they're dealing with, with these traumatic events. Exactly. I, that is absolutely true. All right. So the name of the book is Struggle Well, Thriving in the Aftermath of Trauma, released May 1st. Where can we find you online, Ken? So um, our website, strugglewell.com. And um, you can see some of the nonprofit work we do with soldiers uh, in the military bomb disposal. It's explosive ordnance disposal, EOD. So EODWarriorFoundation.org. And then our two retreat centers where we actually teach post-traumatic growth. You can find it at BoulderCrestRetreat.org. Thank you. It's been a pleasure having you. Yes. Thank you so thank much you, for coming on the show. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in to this week's episode of the Psych Central Show podcast. And remember, you can get one week of free, convenient, affordable, private online counseling anytime, anywhere 
one week for free. Just go to betterhelp.com slash psych central. See everyone next week. Thank you for listening to the psych central show. Please rate review and subscribe on iTunes or wherever you found this podcast. We encourage you to share our show on social media and with friends and family. Previous episodes can be found at psychcentral.com slash show. Psychcentral.com is the internet's oldest and largest independent mental health website. Psych Central is overseen by Dr. John Grohall, a mental health expert and one of the pioneering leaders in online mental health. Our host, Gabe Howard, is an award-winning writer and speaker who travels nationally. You can find more information on Gabe at gabehoward.com. Our co-host, Vincent M. Wales, is a trained suicide prevention crisis counselor and author of several award-winning speculative fiction novels. You can learn more about Vincent at vincentmwales.com. If you have feedback about the show, please email talkback at psychcentral.com.